Welcome back to the Muskogee History course. The next session will include the removal period to allotment. The images and reproductions we used may not be all historically accurate, but represent time periods. In the 1830s, the United States Congress passed the Indian Removal Act and a second treaty of Washington ceded all of Alabama lands and dividing the remaining lands between the Creeks who did not want to join McIntosh's group in Indian Territory. There were some uh, Muscogee people that stayed in Alabama at that time and in Georgia, but the majority of those people were uh, to move uh, through a forced removal. And forbidden by Georgia state law for Indians to testify in court, the Muscogees were legally powerless to protect their lands. You must remember that Muscogee people at that time were educated people. We had attorneys, we had lawyers, we had doctors, we had professional men and women who were educated, and yet they were totally powerless against uh, laws in Georgia. In the 1827 and 38, approximately 23,000 tribal members were forcibly marched on the 1,200 mile painful journey to Indian Territory. An estimated 3,500 Creeks died on that trail, and an estimated 2,500 Creeks were considered to be prisoners, and they were shackled and placed on steamboats at Montgomery, Alabama. 300 died tragically on the steamboat Mammoth in the Mississippi River. The final removal took place in the winter of 1838 when 500 Creek families were forced to leave their homes. And so there was a lot of starvation. There were a lot of uh, pneumonia and disease that happened on, our, on that trail. And so we lost many, many Muscogee people on the removal. The forced removal, many of the tribal towns brought with them their sacred fire, which was their soul and their heart and established the traditional way of living in the, new, in the new Indian Territory. It helped them preserve themselves on the long journey from their homeland. This fire was the focal point for many of the tribal towns They established roots in the new lands. The tribal towns were very strong when they entered into the new lands in Indian Territory. Even though each and every creek encountered great tragedy and trauma during the removal to Indian Territory, they remained courageous and hopeful that the new land would bring peace for them. The creek identity remained strong through this ordeal that brought enormous personal loss. The creek spirit was not broken. And now we're going to go into the Indian Territory. With the Muscogee people coming into the Indian Territory, you can see on the slide uh, the two different routes that they took. The uh, northern route was up uh, in uh, Alabama and went on up into Tennessee, into Arkansas, and then into Indian Territory. Where the southern route was down into the Gulf of Mexico, up the Mississippi River at Louisiana, and then into Arkansas, and then of course on into Indian Territory. Um, you can also see the section uh, in the slide that encompasses the Creek Nation territory. As Muscogee people arrived in Indian Territory, the Treaty of 1832 with the Upper Creek was the precursor to forced removal, where thousands of Creeks lost their lives. The sacrifices that were made could never be compensated with the treaty. Leaders pushed for larger and more allotments and insisted on funds for public work projects in the new lands. The Treaty of 1833 with the Lower Creeks granted a land patent to the Creek Nation. The most accredited type of land conveyance is a land patent that is greater than the Aboriginal title. The Creeks erected new homes and transplanted the religious and political institutions and worked hard to strengthen their independent republic. The survival of Creek families from the homelands to Indian Territory depended on their ability to adapt to a new environment and persevere against adversity. Creek communities replicated as much as they could the life they left behind in the East by staying close to the rivers and planting cornfields in their new towns. The western non-traditional creeks resided near Arkansas and Fertigrease River, while the eastern traditional creeks settled near the Canadian rivers. The pre-war between the states 
the treaties which encompass that period were the treaties of 1835 and 1837. They were significant in that it involved other Indian nations, including the Creeks, as a pact of peace and friendship. The Treaty of 1838 made provisions for those Creeks who were promised payments and goods during the removal that were not received. The Treaty of 1854 nullified Articles 3 and 4 of the 1838 Treaty and provided monetary investment and payment. And the treaties of 1845 and 1856 addressed the boundaries of the Creek and Seminole nations. And the war between the states in the 1860s involved the Creek Nation with the Lower Creek siding with the Confederacy and others with the unions. You must remember that the Lower Creeks uh, were uh, aligning themselves more with the white man's culture and also might have been slaveholders and so they, they uh, of course sided with the Confederacy. But the majority of the Muscogee Creek people uh, did not align themselves with either uh, the North or the South. As we go on toward the effects of war between the states, you remember that the Upper Creeks were uh, known as Loyal Creeks. They were more traditional in nature. Uh, they were led by Apothahola, who uh, attempted to remain neutral in the war by moving to Kansas in the North. Apothahola believed that the Creeks should remain neutral in what he saw was a white man's war. But under his visionary leadership, he led 6,000 Creeks into safety from the Southern Creek Nation out of harm's way. His goal was to secure a new treaty that would be representative of the loyal Creek needs. And his desire was to meet with President Lincoln about his tribal members. But before this could happen, this great Muscogee leader passed away. The rebuilding after the war was as difficult as the removal because the Treaty of 1866 was the final treaty between the United States and the Creek Nation and was punishment again for the Lower Creek signing with the 1861 Treaty with the Confederate States of America. I have shared with you every time there was a treaty that involved the Muscogee people as well as other Native Americans. These treaties were detrimental to the Native people. The war between the states facilitated the creation of a new Creek Constitution in 1867 and includes the adoption of free slaves into the nation as citizens. In 1889, the Creek Nation was paid $2.3 million for land ceded in the 1866 treaty. The Upper Creeks resided in the southern half of the Muscogee Nation, with the Lower Creeks living predominantly in the northern half. The Upper Creeks perpetrated their economic system in which town leaders took charge of the harvest and the tribe's annuity payments. Annuity money was used for public works projects, including grist mills and ferries, and Creeks were known for budgeting their tribal funds wisely. The Lower Creeks were influenced by mainstream American culture, which affected their perception of economics, social, and political issues. And as you can see on the slide, there's a picture of the Okmulgee capital in Indian Territory in 1878. That is the old um, Muscogee Council House downtown here in Okmulgee. This particularly was interesting because this, I believe, is the oldest picture that we have of the Council House where it was a log structure. That was burned down, of course, and then, of course, the, the sandstone structure is what we have today. You can see in this particular slide that they uh, were having a general council meeting of delegates from 34 tribes in Oklahoma. The Muscogee people have always been uh, a nation that has moved forward in its leadership in many areas, and so it was not unusual for them to bring together tribes from other nations to discuss the issues concerning their people. In this particular map on the slide, you can see the creek towns, the ceremonial grounds and where they're located. Uh, there's on, on the Arkansas River in Deep Fork. Uh, you can also see um, the North Canadian River uh, and the North Fork as it runs into that. And you can see a number of our tribal towns that are located uh, in this particular map.
In this particular slide, we have uh, a number of our creek towns in the 1900s. You can see the uh, Alabama town, Arbica, uh, Artesy, Big Spring, Broken Era, uh, many of them, uh, Thoplaco and Tuckabachi. There are a number of our creek towns listed in this particular slide. In Indian Territory, the ceremonial grounds today, of course, uh, we have 16 active ceremonial grounds, as you see in the slide, and each still maintains a sacred fire which in many cases was brought from the East during the removal. The communities associated with these grounds act both independently and as part of the Muscogee Creek Nation and serve many of the same political and spiritual purposes as the original tribal towns. In this particular slide, we have the church listings as of today. You can see on the map that we have Arbica, uh, Belvin Baptist Church, Big Casita. Many of these churches were Methodist and Baptist. We would like for you to remember that our churches are very important to the Muscogee Nation. Christianity came into the Confederacy uh, very far back when the white settlers first came into uh, our lands. Uh, generally speaking, they were uh, people that had probably um, aligned themselves with Cromwell in England and uh, Cromwell, of course, was fighting against the high taxation and the, uh, of the king at that time. And of course, when the king came back into leadership, they, uh, they disposed and killed Cromwell, and many of his followers fled into the New World. They were primarily um, people that aligned themselves with the Presbyterian Church at that time. And when they came into the New World, there were, um, again, divisions the Methodists, of course, uh, were uh, part of that movement, and so were the Baptists. And in our nation today, we have several Methodist and Baptist churches. Um, they are very important to our communities because they, uh, they helped institute language studies and uh, the studies of our nation as a whole and, uh, and kept our communities um, abreast of the spiritual importance uh, in the people. The Creek schools in Muscogee country, uh, because they, Muscogee people believed primarily in educating their children uh, from the earliest of times. There were legends and uh, uh, stories that were told by their grandparents. Uh, and so a lot of the oral history which we have uh, goes very far back into ancient times. However, our, our people were very much interested in educating their children and so they developed tribal schools and a system in the Creek Nation at that time. Uh, and they were funded by annuities consisting of, um, at that time, seven boarding schools for Indian children. There were three boarding schools for the descendants of freedmen and 65 day schools. Some of these schools were set up so that uh, the nation itself or the people that were farmers could uh, harvest their crops and bring their crops in. Uh, teachers were appointed at a uniform salary of about $25 a month uh, with a requirement of 10, uh, average of 10 students. Uh, an additional $2 a month for each additional pupil was added to the average. Uh, the Creeks have always built their reputation on having a well-developed system of education. And in the early 1900s, the superintendent for Creek schools estimated that the literacy rate of Creek people that could read and write to be 95%. You can see a picture of the first reader uh, that was reprinted by Frank Belvin by the general missionaries to the Creek in the 1960s. This particular slide shows an illustration of the Muscogee alphabet. And this particular alphabet was adopted by the Muscogee Creek Nation in 1853. Previous to that, many alphabets were in use. As we go on to the different uh, schools that the Muscogee Nation developed during this time, we have the Tallahassee Labor uh, School. It was a manual labor school that was located 10 miles north of present Muscogee. And if you go up there today, you can still see uh, many of the old buildings and where the old buildings stood at that time. Uh, the picture, uh, the slide shows the Coweta Mission, a day school was opened in 1843 and the Law Ridge Boarding School was opened in 1851. The Asbury Manual Labor School was opened by the Methodists northeast of Eufaula, and that is under Lake Eufaula now, and I remember uh, when I was a child going down uh, off of that 
a hill down into the uh, North Canadian River and seeing uh, Asbury, a beautiful Asbury school located uh, at the bottom now of Eufaula Lake. Harrell Institute, a Methodist school, was awarded a charter in 1881 at the Crete Nation's Higher Education Institution in Muskogee. But Bacon College, Indian University, was awarded a charter and a land grant from the Crete Nation in 1885. A.C. Bacon, who was president of Indian University, wanted a more central located uh, position for the college. He contacted Principal Chief Samuel Schott for land to build this university. The National Council of the Muskogee at first rejected the idea of an Indian university until Chief Schott respectfully suggested they reconsider the issue. The council did reconsider and voted to set aside 160 acres north of Muskogee. Chief Schott wanted an institution of higher learning not just for young men, but he wanted to send the daughters of the Muskogee people to this institution to be educated. In the 1890s, Levering Mission opened near Wetumpka, Nuyaka Mission west of Okmulgee, and Yuchi in Sapalpa. The Nuyaka Mission is still located west of Okmulgee. Wilaga replaced Tallahassee, which burned in 1880. And as you see on the slide, the Walika Creek Mission School baseball team in 1899. And in the 1879 election, there were uh, political parties formed. One was known as the PEN and later reorganized as the Nationalist Party who were supporting Choate or Chakoti, uh, Chakota we have today. Uh, but Choate is a French term, so I'm using that, that uh, pronunciation. A second party known as the Muskogee Party was led by Ward Coachman and mainly opposed the PENs. The third was the Loyal Party, which nominated Ispaichi. The primary differences in the parties were both the Loyal and National Parties favored a more traditional form of government, but the Muskogee Party being more moderate and willing to compromise over white migration into Indian territory, which the other two were not prepared to do. In 1883, three political parties, the Loyal, Muskogee, and Penn, were in existence during the election for chief, second chief, members of the House of Kings and the House of Warriors. Nominees at that time were as follows. The Penn Party, Principal Chief, Samuel Choate, and the second chief, Kawita Miko. The Muskogee Party, Principal Chief, J. M. Perryman, and the second chief, Sam Brown. The Loyal Party, Principal Chief, Ispaichi, and second chief, James Fife. We want to go now into the pre-allotment period uh, of our nation. And uh, with the treaties that the United States uh, had recognized Indian nations, uh, as well as the Creeks, and they were independent sovereigns. Uh, and even though the federal government had acknowledged the tribes as distinct political communities with full authority and rights to manage their own affairs, the United States took a paternalistic attitude toward the native people. The federal policy was one of a simulation in which the ownership of land would be owned individually and not in common. To bring about a simulation, the federal government gained legal control over the tribes through legislation, such as the Dawes Allotment Act. An 1871 act ending treaty making provided that the legal groundwork was necessary to begin a simulation lawmaking. As you can see in the picture, the Dawes Commission headquarters was in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And in 1887, Congress passed the most assimilative law, the Land and Severality Act, also known as the Dawes Act or the Allotment Act. The act's aim was to assimilate Indians into white society by teaching them the techniques of farming and the values of individualism and private ownership. As you can see in the slide, there are pictures of the Dawes Commission. Uh, within that group is uh, leaders of the Muskogee Nation, such as Espaichi. Uh, he's seated from the third from the right, and Rolly McIntosh, uh, second from the right, and George Grayson, who is on the last row from the left. Uh, these were Muskogee leaders at the time, and in 1893, Congress created the Special Commission 
uh, headed by Senator Dawes, to negotiate allotment agreements. The specific law was written for the five tribes allotment. The Dawes Act divided communal Indian lands into individual allotments, eradicating tribal governance and opening up reservation land to white settlement. It was believed that this legislation would civilize Indians. The president could allot acres to individual Indians. Uh, the head of the family received 160 acres, single persons 18 and over uh, 80 acres, Boys under 18 got 40 acres, and married Indian women were not entitled. You can see that the matriarchal line, as far as the Dawes Commission was concerned, was to do away with any lands which had to do with the matriarchal line. The mothers no longer owned the land, uh, as, and as a matter of fact, it was going into the hands of individual Indian owners. In this particular slide, uh, there's a flyer of Indian lands for sale. Uh, it says to get a home of your own, easy payments, perfect title, possession within 30 days. These were fine lands in the West that were given to uh, the white settlers. They were lands that, were, that says here that they were ready for grazing, agricultural, dry farming, irrigated, irrigatable land. Uh, the land here was from the different states of Colorado, Idaho, Kansas, Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota, included Oklahoma, Oregon, South Dakota, Washington, Wisconsin and Wyoming, thousands and thousands of, of Indian land uh, that was going to be auctioned off to uh, different settlers. Um, it was estimated that particularly in this year there were 350,000 acres offered for sale. At this point we're going to take a break and we will continue with the next video in our series.